welcome to episode 731 of Long Box Heroes, the Lamborghini of comic book podcasts. Joe and Todd here. Todd, hello. How are you? I'm doing great. We're going to do a podcast about comics. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I was almost going to swear several times, not at you. Mm. Uh, the way that I have my little notepad thing formatted. Right. The way that I'm sitting, the microphone is kind of like right in the line of it. Mm-hmm. So it's bleeding over into the email that I have open as well. And it's just like a jumble of words. Words? Yes. He says hi, by the way. Oh, I'll say hi back. <laughs> oh, hi, Todd. How are you doing today? <laughs> good, good. Good to hear. So you want to get into the show since we got a lot to talk about this week? Right. Should be a short show. So let's start it. Right. So uh, big to do wins in the upcoming uh, G.I. Joe image number one. Big to do wins over at Batman. Like, why is the book so late? And uh, if you have been waiting for the Marvel DC crossover, Amalgam crossover omnibus thing, Todd, you want to hate your catchphrase? <laughs> no, I'm good. Well, I'm afraid Todd has some bad news for you. Oh, I didn't. I No, I have some terrible news, Todd. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, the return of the Rob Watch. Oh, as, boy. Uh, the Rob has returned to uh, one of his uh, most notorious creations. <laughs> uh, we have our walk down Lois Lane, where Becky delves back into the 50s this time for some <laughs> prime Clark and Lois action. What we read from this past week which would be Absolute Power number four, DC All In Special number one, and Hyde Street number one from Image Comics from the Ghost Machine imprint. Uh, what we're looking forward to coming out this week, uh, discussion of Todd and Joe have issues as we read issue 23 of Gail Simone, but not this issue's Secret Six, and TV talk of the latest episodes of The Penguin and Agatha, whatever the full title of the show is. It's just called Agatha. Right. Let's streamline it to shorten things. Exactly. So, uh, I am excited for the new G.I. Joe book that's coming out as part of the Energon universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know there's another G.I. Joe book that's being printed at Image that is the continuation, allegedly, numbering of the old Marvel book and all the other times that that's gone through. Larry Hama is working on that. Uh, but this is Joshua Williamson, Tom Riley, Jordi Belair, and we talked a couple weeks ago, maybe, that the issue of Transformers that comes out this week has a spoiler cover. Right. Uh, maybe the return of a big to-do in in the world of the Transformers. Maybe it's related to the G.I. Joe book. Maybe it's not, but we won't know because, at the very least, with any sort of review copies of the G.I. Joe book that's going out, they are not including the last several pages of the book. While they want people to talk about the book, they don't want the book spoiled until the day before it comes out and everyone posts it on eBay anyway. Right. But I'll say this, of all the stuff like that, that's a great idea because you're going to get a lot of mileage. Guess what? We're talking about it right now. You're going to get mileage out of it because it's going to be like, oh, look, everybody's talking about the book, but why did they redact those those pages? What were in those pages? Could those pages be like whoever? Like you have a million speculations in comics and speculating is always good. Um, You just, you get, you get buzz and it doesn't ruin the issue um, early and obviously like you said the day anything hits there's always some smart aleck who's throwing it out on twitter ebay facebook whatever so but this is the best way to not do it and get traction i think right marvel should have learned from this Mm -hmm. instead of doing the extra content with the qr code um but again obviously this is review copies going out to media sites podcasts etc so they're not spoiling the book because usually image rolls their preview books out the Friday before they come out. And Mm -hmm. apparently it's big enough that they're not giving it to everyone, you know? Right. And I only bring it up because it's a unique thing. I could definitely, I'm surprised more publishers don't do that with big launch books that they're given uh, previews out to, you know? Right. Right. I hope it's Unicron. Uh, By the time this comes out, I guess that's a spoiler. I don't know. I don't know. Could be. I, 
So if you subscribe to Chip Zdarsky's uh, newsletter, Substack, what is he on? He's on Substack, right? Uh, so for the longest time, the Batman book that Chip has been doing has been twice a month. Then during uh, Absolute Power, it went to once a month, just so it can line up with what was going on in Absolute Power. And then with Absolute Power being over, it looked like it was going back to that two month or the uh, the uh, twice a month schedule. But now the issues that had been solicited um, are now being pushed back by like two months. And Chip in his newsletter said, speaking of Batman, news came out this week uh, about issue 54 being pushed back. Normally, I don't comment on such things because I'm above it. Hardy har har. But I wanted everyone to know that this has nothing to do with creative delays on our part. Issues 153 and 54 are done. Heck, even 155 is being colored as we speak. So this is separate from anyone working on the book. It's a publishing decision that's far beyond my pay grade. I'm just a writer. Leave me alone. <laughs> um. Now... DC hasn't updated the ship date for 156 yet. Like if you go to their their page, um, you know, 154 is moved to November, 55 to December, um, 56, 156 presumably to January, and 157 presumably to February. <laughs> now, again, it's going away from a twice a month schedule, but it's just delayed a little bit, which is no big deal. And the book is done, which makes me wonder, why is this book being delayed, Todd? Right. Well, we do not deal in rumor and innuendo here. No, we don't. But there is speculation that sometime in 2025, Jim Lee and Jeff Loeb are going to be returning to the mainline Batman book, just like they did all those years ago to give us hush quality aside is one of the most notable Batman stories of the last 25 years. And, you know, maybe they just told uh chip to turn the spigot off just a little bit. Right. You're still going to do the book, but you're going to get X amount of months off, but you know, build up what you need to build up, I guess. Um, cause you know, you got three books already done in the can and, uh, if we give Jim and Jeff a lead time of maybe six to seven months, you know, maybe we won't have to worry about it. Right. And if their run's going to be, I'm just saying, speculation, if Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee's run is going to be 12 issues and you give them a six month head start, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 will only be a year and a half late. <laughs> That's all. That's just my. My my guess, if I'm doing my DC late math, you know what I mean? Right. But um, I, if that is true, I mean, obviously, Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee did hush. Like you said, one of the most famous stories in the last 25 years, d- d- you know, depending on w- your mileage may vary on the ending. Mine, mine does. Um, uh, it's going to get sales. Jim Lee on Batman is going to get sales. But what's going to make me sad is because uh, they did that all in issue of Batman, which all the DC books now after uh, Absolute Power and all in are going to kind of have a new jumping on point. And I read this Chip Zdarsky 154, uh, 153, I'm sorry. And it was so good. Like it was literally, if all the books are going to be like, this they are great jumping on points for everybody because as i read this it doesn't feel like a jumping off point and then there's seven ongoing stories in it and they're all interesting to me and it and it's like oh please if you're gonna give uh jim lee this book let him run uh let chip Chip zadarsky run with this somehow some way because chip zadarsky's batman is really good now that it's grounded and not like all crazy wacky stuff that it's been for the past year and a half yeah and we're not going to get too too you know we have a lot of books to talk about i really enjoyed the latest issue that chip Mm -hmm. did i thought it was really good for the same reasons that you mentioned uh i really like the art in it as well and I'm a sucker for babyface-ish Riddler. Right. Who is less about causing crimes, but more so about just trying to prove that he's better than Batman as a detective. 
But now he's also trying to prove that he's better as a billionaire than Bruce Wayne, which is like a really cool hook Mm -hmm. for for the book. Um, Now, I I hope that they're letting uh, Chip not burn through the story enough that it gets to a definitive enough of a break point. Right. That they can put a hold in the story and hopefully not kill the momentum of the book and what Chip is doing. Because, you know, just recently, within the last however many years it was, when for different reasons, DC didn't like the direction that Tom King's Batman was going to go, they had Chip take the book over, and they just gave Tom King the Batman Catwoman book to do what he wanted to do. Essentially, Mm -hmm. one, so he could do what he wanted to do. Two, so they could Mm -hmm. make a bunch of money on that book. And three, ignore the story that he was telling in that book. Right. Though, let me just ask one question. Wasn't it Joshua Williams who took over for a little bit? Oh, that's right. It was Joshua Williams and then Chip Zdarsky. My apologies. Right. But and then Joshua Williams. Right. No, I'm with you. But then they ruined, because I like Joshua Williams to start, and then he got three issues in, and they locked him into a giant crossover. You know what I mean? And it's right. just rough when you're doing Batman, because anytime you try to get ground, uh, they go, no, you have to be part of something bigger and get all these books going. That might be the one upswing from a Jeff Lowe Batman, uh, Jim Lee Batman story, because it'll have so much lead time. You won't be able to, like, you'll be like, right, just let them do what they're going to do. I feel as long as Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee are on the book, uh, there won't be giant crossovers. I, I don't know why call me wacky, but that's just a hope I have. And you were being ambitious and saying 12. I say it's going to be six. I don't know. That whole thing with them, I think because Hush was 12, they want it to be 12. And Long Halloween was 12. That's the legendary Batman story length now. So I'll go you this. We're going to get six. And then if we're going to get another six, it's going to be a while. It's probably going to be six, then maybe a six month break. And then the next six. By six month break, you mean a fill in though, right? Yeah. It's not like there's not going to be a Batman book for those six months. It's just not going to be Jim Lee and Jeff Loeb on the book for that six month window. Mm, Interesting. This could go a million different ways. So. Right. I always go back to the late 90s when uh, Kevin Smith did the Daredevil run and then the first like four or five issues were on time. And then mm-hmm. The last like two issues were late. He gets the offer from DC to go do Green Arrow and whoever was in charge of DC at the time says to him, we are not soliciting the first issue of this book until you have turned in nine scripts. Right. right. And wouldn't you know, the last three issues of his, well, the next three, so he turns in those nine scripts, no problem. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it was the last three issues, and then the last two issues, because he only did about 15 issues on it. So Mm -hmm. it was like those first nine issues came out like clockwork, then there was a little bit of a break between nine and ten, and then there was a little bit of a break between twelve and thirteen. I never understand why if you want late creators to do, it's like they're, it's almost like it's a business, Joe. Mm -hmm. Um, They they go, they're like, all right, get nine in the can. And that way we can't be late. Yes, you can. Because once they feel they have that buffer, they, they go and putter around and do other things where it's, if you want them to do 12, when 12 is handed in, solicit that book and you'll never have a late book. And to me, it doesn't change. Because you're still going to have them do 12 straight issues. Do you know what I mean? I don't. Right. It, it boggles the mind. It's just like, oh, if we get six or seven, we have the head start. We could start making that money that we're paying these guys, like these big names back immediately. I, I'm like, you're going to get it in the end. Just just do it. But that's why I'm not running DC, though. I'm just trying to look here to see if I could see where the lateness came in. Mm-hmm. Okay, so my I, I'm going to stand corrected. So the first 12 issues, no problem on time. Two months in between 12 and 13. Mm-hmm. Three months in between 13 and 14. Right. And then, and, 15, I, and then 15, 16, 17, 18, whatever came out, no problem. And I could have swore there was fill-ins in there for a uh, writer. Um, like- I don't think so but i could certainly look up that as well 
I believe it was Scott Beatty who wrote an issue or two in there. What like the book book was late and not late because but then when it was late, they were like, Scott, give us an issue. And he did one or two. And that's why uh, you know what I mean? Like the book came back for a little bit. But I could be wrong. I have a tendency to do that. Um, as far as I could see here, mm-hmm. it was Kevin Smith. Um, and Phil Hester right up through to 15. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, there was no, and then it was Brad Melter who took over with 16. Okay. If you remember that. Yeah. My mistake. No, it's okay. Listen, we're, we're here to correct each other. You know, we don't want to be spreading misinformation. Nope. So it'll be interesting to see how and if this goes. Personally, I say let Chip do his book as is. I think just do the Jim Lee, Jeff Loeb separately. But I get why Jim Lee and Jeff Loeb maybe want that prestige of, like, I want the regular Batman book. When we did Hush, it wasn't separate. It was part of the main Batman book sort of thing. Right. Well, he said that when he did Hush. He goes, if you're going to have me come on, I'm not going to do a maxi series. Mm Mm-hmm. Bring prestige back to the main Batman book, and that's what he's doing again. Yep. So, uh, so last but not least, wither the DC Marvel Amalgam Omnibus. Mm-hmm. So there was supposed to be the two big omnibuses coming out this year. Um, the crossover one delayed, but still on the schedule. Hopefully, it'll be out by the end of the year. The Amalgam one, Todd. Um, yeah. There's no date on it. It's just gone. Mm-hmm. Um, the word is that there was a uh, printer error. Shocking. That um, a five-figure numbered run of the book just had to be completely scrapped. Hoped. Yes. Um their original idea was supposed to only do 3,000, but because orders were so strong, they went up to that much of a number. And to quote from the article that we're reading this from, mm-hmm. um, I'm I'm told not to expect it on the shelves until a while into 2025, and how that goes may depend on the printer's insurance. Oh, boy. Yeah. Joe, why couldn't it have been less popular? Then we would have only had a pulp 3,000 of them. Oh, oh sure. God. That's how it works. <laughs> yep. That is bad, Joe. And I'm guessing the uh, Amalgam one was, what do I want to say, the Marvel printer? And I'm guessing that one was the DC printer because <laughs> DC seems to put their foot in their mouth, but I could be wrong. Um, that's, and so between me and you, when all this is going on, the first thing that I did was let's see what's going on with the, uh, 1982 style guide. Yep. That, well, that was ink. That was different. Right. Um, this one, no, up, uh, no update in the 1982 style guide that's coming along because that was being printed, um, at a different place than the omnibuses were. Right. And I feel bad for the people that ordered this. You weren't getting a complete version of it anyway for Mm -hmm. very good reasons. Right. But I really feel as though this collection is snake bit. It's never coming out. Right. Now, I'll say this about the style guide. The way they made it sound was that they sent proofs to DC and they didn't like the coloring. I'm sorry, not the inking. So they couldn't get the coloring right at their printer. So they went and took it someplace else. Now you got to get in the rotation. So hopefully with the style guide one, it was, we didn't print any of these. We just couldn't get it right the first time, which is the way it should work is when you catch the mistake. You know what I mean? Instead of what they're doing with these Omnibuy, which is like, oh, we print out 15,000 of pages are missing and we don't make good or maybe we'll send you a printed page you can glue in or whatever. Yeah, all of a sudden, because of your mistake, I'm a book binder now? No, I don't think so. Um, Joe, it's making me start to, start to think to not buy Omnibuy. Start to think to not buy Omnibuy. 
This is how you like, how far do you go with this sort of thing? Like, mm-hmm. what is the tipping point for people to say enough is enough? I'm not going to order these anymore because, you know, we, we talk about them all the time and it, it's not every omnibus, but it's like around half. I, I was going to say less than half, but right, I but get I, what I'm you're saying. saying. It's, because it's there's definitely a... not, it's definitely not half, but. Probably like 45 percent, 40 percent. I would have to. And here's my take on this. And I'm not trying to be, you know, like confrontational, but I would say it's less than that. Way less. Just because of the fact we don't hear about all the good ones. And there are a lot of Omnibuy that come out in a year. Right. So if you have two bad ones in a year, but you have 20 good ones, you know what I mean? That's not half. I don't know. We'd have to do the actual, like, we'd have to sit down and go from here on out, keep track. And that would be somebody's job. I don't know who's good at spreadsheets like that. But these are all the Omnibuy coming out. And when one goes off, go, these went off without a hitch. You know what I mean? But this one is the one that got screwed. I feel like it's one out of every 10 or 12. Uh, and see, I I feel it's a little, like, you know, one out of every 10 or 12, you're under, you're at like 8 to 10%. And it's definitely not 50. Maybe I'm being exaggerating. I'd say it's probably like closer to like one out of every five. Okay. Like 25 I mean, that to 30%. Would be numbers that, that would be numbers that I could wrap my head around and see. See, I can't. I, I mean, and obviously now that I'm, I'm guessing like you're being a little bit funny with like 50%. Because there's no way that they would continue printing books at 50% wrong, 40% wrong. Um, that would just be w- wacky numbers because people would just stop and then there would be no right. money in it. Yeah. But I mean, complete us and everything. I don't know. I, I think I might have a new project. We'll see. I was going to say, all I need is a free afternoon and that's uh, all I could, I could devote a lot of time to this. We have plenty of free afternoons. So. Oh, I certainly do. Mm-hmm. You know, who's not going to have many free afternoons here in the coming years. Ask not for whom the Rob Trolls. The Rob Trolls for thee. And now, the Rob Watch. That's right. The Rob had the big announcement today. Rob is bringing Youngblood back to Image in 2025. Wow. Now... Rob lost the rights to the Youngblood characters. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why he tried to create a new fake Youngblood like four years ago and was doing stuff recently with Last Blood with all the other characters that he still had access to. Uh, your brigades and your prophets and your people like that. Um, but it was on Hollywood Reporter and all the press junkets that the Rob does his stuff through that Image in 2025, they're going to do a vault edition. They're going to do an artist edition with Mm -hmm. high-res scans from the original art from the original series uh, in a deluxe oversized hardcover. They're going to do a facsimile edition to commemorate the 33rd anniversary of Youngblood, you know, because those are all the ones that you commemorate. You you commemorate by 33rds, I guess. Mm Mm-hmm. And there is going to be a new series written and drawn by the Rob. Um, And it's going to be in conjunction with the company that the Rob sold the rights to, which is this company, Rip Media. Mm -hmm. Uh, From the Hollywood Reporter article, the Rob says, It's so great that I could run into the comfort of the characters I created that (laughs) launched a movement. They yeah. carry such history. I love Young Blood so much. These characters are my absolute passion. I would say I always re- equated the Rob's art with a movement. So, right, I'm fine with that. I'm surprised. I'm just glad he got to license the characters he created and owned all those years ago. Right, and you know, obviously, we've talked before about the story of how the Rob lost the rights to these characters and. You know, as as recently, uh, you know, as recently as let's say I don't know however many years ago it was, you know, five six years ago, the Rob had kind of written it off that he was never going to get these characters back, and he had moved on and everything else like that. 
Um, but I, I'm happy for the Rob. He seems very passionate about these characters. I absolutely do not hold any sort of fondness or anything that the Rob has created in his last 32 years of being a comic book creator. Mm -hmm. Um, but the Rob definitely has a fan base, his name and his characters and his art definitely has a place in this industry for people that are willing to spend the money on it. Rob has proven it time and time again. My only concern is, um, that the Rob stated earlier this year that he was having some health issues. Um, you know, he had gotten shingles and he went to the doctor and everything was fine, but it kind of put him into, a mindset of I only have so much time left that my hand eye coordination and my, you know, ability to even draw is going to be a thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're raw books, not a major publisher. They're going to be books that are late. Right. No, I only like, and I sincerely worry and we kid the Rob because it's the Rob. But I sincerely worry that if the Rob was this concerned just six months ago about his health and his ability to be able to draw and see it, how much of Youngblood is he going to actually get to do. Mm -hmm. And I, it definitely would seem as though this is going to be the last major thing that he does in comics. Right. Um, I, I don't know, because I just hope... And I'm not saying because he could be sick, like you said, and or you know he's he's got on the downslope of his career and stuff like that. I just like to think that this is another marketing practice to be like, oh, I have a limited time, a limited stuff, so this is all you're going to get. You know what I mean? Um, but I will not belittle anybody's health. So I always I always like to think anything that's give like approached me with is an opportunity. So like you know I always like worry about that stuff, and and I feel that. But I don't know. I think he'll get. Get a bunch of it done um when that'll happen god only knows and you know it'll have a ton of inkers and stuff like that but you know i wish him wish him all the best in the world i'm just surprised after he lost uh young blood he didn't like come out and announce like i have a new group of characters that's completely different from young blood they're called juvenile plasma or something like that just straight up <laughs> ripping off his own stuff he oh. so he, he kind of sort of did. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, it was in the article, unless we got it off bleeding cool. Right. Um, he did a um, or at least attempted to get something off the ground. Um, it was right as the pandemic was hitting, right. it was a book that was called EKO 92, right? And it definitely kind of sort of looked like young blood with just different colors was that the one with the guy gardener costume that was just with the serial numbers filed off um no so it was like so the it was the shaft costume but mm -hmm. instead of like red and white it was blue and white and he had shoulder pads oh okay instead of the die hard costume and again everyone knows die hard right right um die hard is like white with blue accents this was like black with gold accents mm. uh chapel was a lady and uh bad rock was bad rock uh that mm. that didn't change um right because didn't he still own bad rock somehow no he just kind of did the same character oh okay but I'll say when you all, when anybody ever says, you know, Die Hard, I immediately go to the Justice League International villain group called the Extremist, which were just all rip off of the big six Marvel villains. And Die Hard was just the Magneto knockoff. Do you mm -hmm. remember that? I do. Oh, I love Die Hard and the Extremist. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, again, if you're a Rob fan, 2025 is going to be your year. Um, you know, I hope the Rob gets to do everything he wants to do in comics i won't be me buying, too though. me too uh there are conventions this weekend but nobody's making any big appearances it just seems as though a lot of people are selling books um right. head over to fancons.com which is the site that we use for the schedule and see if there's something in your area that uh strikes your fancy and go buy some comics this weekend it's almost like they're building up to something con -wise. yeah i don't know 
Uh, there's a big one next weekend that we'll talk about next weekend, right? Right. Uh, but you could also check out Soon To Be Named Network uh, at soon to be named network.tumblr.com. Anytime any of the shows in the Soon To Be Named Network go live, of course, you could find them at their own individual sites. You could find them through the podcatcher of your choice, or there's the one stop shop for all of the shows in the soon to be aimed network. And that includes, of course, this show that you're listening to right now, long box heroes after dark puzzle warriors, three profane arguments at odds with wrestling. We need wrestling final wrestling place wings on wings, which is reaching its end. They had some big news over on Instagram in regards to their final episodes. If you're an Instagram person, definitely go check that out. If you're a fan of the wings on wings, folks, and of course, porch talk. Mm-hmm. Anytime those shows go live or anytime any of the folks from those shows go on other shows and they let me know, you'll find them all over at soon to be named network.tumblr.com. Mm-hmm. Be sure to check out our friends and some of the other stuff that they're up to in and around the world of comic books. Go check out our friend at Mike Sterling's blog over at progressiveruin.com. Go check out our friend Kevin's blog over at hellionsteam.com. Go check out Rick Williams' The Chop Shop at freekaratechops.storeenvy.com. He's got these resin and glow-in-the-dark and stickers and pins and all sorts of things based on like sci-fi, fantasy, wrestling sort of stuff. They're all really cool. Rick's a good guy. Go check out Jason Sandberg's Jupiter, still available through the Indiegogo. Uh, go check out Chris Runt's Battle Monsters, available over at his site, FortressOfComicNews.com. Go check out our friend Davey of the band Cave People and his self-published comics over at CaveDomainComics.com. Just the other day, Davey teased art for the next book that he's going to be doing sometime in 2025 definitely go check that out and we will be here ready to purchase that when that rolls out of course to support small publishers and of course our friends as well and if you do not have a comic book store in your area or you do not have a good comic book store in your area let our store be your store comics on the green i got the facebook page linked up so that whenever the new books have arrived Dave and the crew will let you know whenever the final order cutoff dates are for the latest and greatest books coming out in the near future toward the end of 2024. Dave and the crew will let you know when Dave gets speculator boxes of people who just decided to stop collecting new mutants. The epi- the issue before Deadpool is introduced, he'll <laughs> let you know about those too. And you can go sign up for the mail order subscription service, get your books mailed to you weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. And if you do, there's a chance that you can get a sketch on the package from our good friend Becky, who we're going to turn things over to now for My Walk Down Lois Lane. Welcome back. So recently, Comics on the Green bought some 1950s World's Finest, and they are a gold mine of fun stories. Before this issue goes to a loving home, I want to talk about it. This is issue 85 from 1956, so let's dive in. In the far-off land of Balkania, Princess Verena wants to travel to America for a visit. While she's there, she wants to see America's two greatest wonders, Batman and Superman. Her Prime Minister, Count Zito, opposes the idea, but she's a princess, and I assume that he'll just be thrown in jail for treason or something. I don't know. I've watched a lot of House of Dragon. Superman pulls in Verena's cruise liner, and Batman does tricks in his bat plane to welcome the princess. Their girlfriends, Lois Lane and Vicky Vale, who I don't approve of dating Batman, are there to see the boys and cover the princess for the newspapers. As the princess is introduced to the American people, it becomes very clear that both boys are trying to get Verena's attention. As a balcony collapses, the two begin to save people in spectacular ways to make sure that Verena is watching. This annoys not only their girlfriends, but Verena's chief aide, Captain Stefan. At a press conference, Verena admits that she's single and could marry an American. Vicky and Lois are horrified to hear this. When asked for her favorite flowers, both Superman and Batman fight to bring her some orchids. Batman brings her a regular bouquet, and Superman brings her a giant, weird-looking orchid from God knows where. 
This now starts a competition between the boys to see who can impress the princess the most. Batman gives her a diamond. Superman squeezes a boulder of coal into a diamond. Batman takes her on a ride in his Batmobile, and while on their scenic drive, Superman carves S. Love V into the mountain. Batman bodyguards her on the royal train. Superman then carries that train to Gotham. Their girlfriends are mad, and they go to confront Verena. While in Gotham City, Commissioner Gordon tells Batman that there are whispers of a plot to steal jewels from Verena, but Batman tells Gordon, don't worry, nobody's touching his upcoming Bat Queen. Vicky and Lois ask Verena to pick a hero so they can go home and cry into a pint of ice cream, and Verena tells him she's not interested in either of them. She's in love with Captain Stefan, but due to her country's laws, marrying him would start a war. The girls generously offer to help Verena elope with Stefan, and Batman and Superman are listening from outside. They are actively trying to prevent Verena from marrying Stefan, so they go tell Count Zito of the girls' plan. Zito tells them Verena's rights. This would spark a war. That's why he asked the boys to pretend they were interested in the princess in the first place. It was to keep Stefan away, but it was also to keep the princess close in case something bad happened. The next day, Verena tells the guys that she needs a hat like the one Lois is wearing, and the boys fly off into the sky, only it's not really them. It's Robin in the bat plane, towing a dummy of Superman on a wire while the boys are hiding in the bushes. The thieves, who have been scoping out the princess's accommodations, seize the boys leaving and decide now's the time to rob the princess. Batman and Superman secretly help Captain Stefan defend the princess from the robbers, while Vicky and Lois make sure to film it, because they're going to sell the story to the newspapers, and maybe Parliament will let them marry. Once the criminals are all defeated, Batman and Superman appear to apprehend them, and Lois brags they were completely useless, and thank God Stefan was here and was so brave. The issue ends with Balkania's parliament agreeing to the marriage and the girl scolding the boys who pretends they are heartbroken that their princess is gone. You can tell that this was kind of based on the movie Roman Holiday with Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn. And if you want to read this story for yourself, it's reprinted in several different things. World's Finest... 188, World's Finest Comic Archives, number one. Showcase Presents World's Finest, number one. That's the 2007 series. Batman and Superman, World's Finest, Silver Age, Omnibus, Volume 1. I highly recommend that. That's amazing. Batman and Superman, World's Finest Comics, The Silver Age, number one from 2017. I really like these books, and I hope you guys did too. Tune in next week for more. Thank you, as always, Becky. And again, going back to the 50s this time, a little bit different, huh? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Different time. Uh, I like how Becky does not approve of Bruce Wayne, Batman, in this instance, still being with Vicky Vale. I have a note on that also. Vicky Vale is the better girlfriend for Batman because Catwoman should be with Slam Bradley. I, I agree with that. Thank you. And I like how Becky, when referring to Batman and Superman in this, and their attempts to woo uh, Verena, she just referred to them as the boys. Yep, I think ah, the that's boys a... went and did this, and the boys went and picked some flowers, and the boys went and got some diamonds. It was just funny how she referred to just oh, it's Superman and Batman. It's the boys, you know, the fellas. They're doing things. right. I think uh, she may correct me if I'm wrong. That's a, one of her favorite shows. Uh, supernatural the the brothers i think they might have been called the boys like but i don't know you'd have to ask her on that but she does that a lot like when she's leaving the shop she'll be like see you boys and stuff like that i don't know i feel like we're all men but she thinks of us as boys and uh i will say when they were competing against each other when it comes to superman versus batman superman wins in at like when she's like oh he drove her in the batmobile but superman carved like a big heart and the the letters and the in the side he gave her a ring superman made a bowl a boulder of coal into a diamond i'm like superman has it all in every category except the bank account batman wins in the bank account era that's it that's that that's that's it that's the list man but couldn't superman turn boulders into diamonds and sell those diamonds and then have money as okay. well Right, but Joe, now you're not thinking logically. 
Because oh, if wow. he did, if he did, that would ruin DC Earth's economy. Be like, oh, these diamonds, they're just worth, like, everybody's got diamonds, money's not worth anything anymore. And then we'd be living in, like, you know, like a, uh, a hippie commune, and who wants that? Not me. <laughs> not me either. So thank you very much, Becky. As always, uh, we love listening to you talk about these old uh, books, Lois Lane, Romance, or otherwise. And if you saw recently over the last weeks, we you know not a full news story on it, but a bunch of those old uh, romance books that Becky has talked about here were going up for like heritage auction, like number ones mm-hmm. that were like high graded ones. Right. And I definitely think that Becky should get a cut of the money on those. Yeah. For bringing them back to prominence in the world of uh, comics in 2024. Right. Yep. Definitely. Uh, So let's get into what we read from this past week. Todd, where would you like to begin? I think even though this is not the book we were both looking forward to, I think uh, we should start with Absolute Power number four, because that'll lead us into the next book, which is written by Mark Wade, art by Dan Mora, the final chapter, you know, in the in the miniseries. And to kind of like give it the the short breeze, not like uh, is it's the the, the final uh, uh, assault on Amanda Waller and her group who have used the Mazo robots and other like uh, things from the Bat Universe and Superman's world to take over and depower the superheroes, except for a few. This is their big plan, their big push: take out the Amazos. What they're going to do to get the powers back. Um, through that, what they're doing to get the powers back uh, kind of is. Uh, affecting the multiverse because um, Amanda Waller has an army that she could use from the multiverse. And maybe by trying to fix everything, it's going to shut off this DC earth from all the multiverse earths and spoiler. It kind of, everything kind of works out powers go back, but maybe they don't go back the way you expect. Things are kind of topsy turvy all over the place. Uh, one of the heroes that we mentioned, uh, a D-lister, gets a glow up um, and, you know, kind of saves the day, which we all kind of predicted. Except and me. In, I thought he well, was going to die, so I'm glad I was wrong. Right. Everybody but you. Um, and then, like, you know, what happens to Amanda Waller? And Amanda Waller kind of gets, like, the Twilight Zone ending in what's her worst nightmare happening as as penance. And I thought that's really cool. But in all of this, it really just does set up Justice League Unlimited and the DC All-In era of comics. I mean, it was good for issue many, but I feel the same week that All-In is going to come out, everybody's going to focus on All-In more than Absolute Power, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And I get why they had to do things the way that they did. You know, you want to strike while the iron is hot. It would have been nice if the ending of Absolute Power got like a week to breathe before All In Special Number One comes out. I totally agree with that. I I really think I forget Strike While the Iron Hot. I think one and then bam, and you have like you know talk into the other one. You know, but go ahead. Yeah. Um. But you know, there was a lot of things that were planted and paid off um, in a very short amount of time over the four issues, stuff that had been brewing for a while. Mm. The Amanda Waller stuff, I feel as though got not got a satisfying enough ending and a, like uh, um, a way to get Waller back in. Like the information's right. still in there. She just can't access it. Maybe mm-hmm. somebody else could access it. A similar thing that happened with Oliver Queen in this. Right. Where they kept a secret from the rest of the Justice League, and the only reason that it worked out was because didn't the telepathic implant that he have break when Waller did whatever it was to take the powers away from people? I think so, and then he had somebody back him up when it was all over. It was like, yeah, if I wasn't taken out, I would have told you all this. You know what I mean? So right. it, all, it all works out in the end. Uh, I, I like the bit that all the powers went back to people, but some people didn't get the right powers, um, which they only touch on briefly here. I'm sure that'll be touched on in some of the other books going right. forward. The only, the only visual one that really stood out on me was Fire and Ice. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, that's cool. So kind of like show how things maybe have gone sideways, but go ahead. Mm-hmm. And then um, I, I like the setup of 
the you know, and it had been, you know, it was more in some of the other ancillary books that we weren't reading, but enough of it was in the main book. The stuff with Alan Scott and the one Amazo, mm-hmm. who ends up getting like a conscience because he was absorbing so many of the good people's powers. He right. started to become good himself, and apparently he's going to be a regular recurring character. So like there was a lot of stuff that happened in this that I'm looking forward to see where it goes to going forward. But as Todd mentioned, the big thing is setting up the new Justice League Unlimited, where essentially the, the crux of it is everybody in the DC universe is in the, in the Justice League now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you want to stay here, you can. You want to do what you want to do, that's great. But if you accept, which everybody, there's no reason nobody would, we're going to give you... Um, you know, your membership card, and then we're going to contact you when we need you. We're going to pair you up with people. We're going to call you towards, um, you know, things that need fixing. And a lot more of that comes up in the DC All In special, which is written by uh, Scott Snyder and Joshua Williamson with art by Dan Mora and Wes Craig. Now, Todd, I, I have some questions about not the contents of the book, not the story per se. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did not know that this was going to be a flip book. That I did know. Okay, so I didn't know. What story did you start with first? The DC one proper, not the dark side one. Okay. I started with the dark side story first because I didn't know any better. Okay. And I'll say this, I did a so deep dive. It's going to be interesting that we're going to come at this book literally from two different ways. And I did a deep dive, just so you know, the digital way is is printed with the DC proper sides first, not the dark oh, side. Interesting. Yep, that's, I mean, I'm not going to say, I mean, you have to print it one way or the other. You know what I mean? Like digitally, right. you can't like go like choose your own adventure book. This is, but the flip book is to us what we have to do. But that being said also, see, I'm just trying to do all these things to show that I'm right and you're wrong <laughs> was when you go to any of the sites and ask about the cover, um, they show the picture of the DC proper side one. So I was, I figured that was the one you go to first. But now I got one of the variant covers. Mm-hmm. Give me a second here. Right. My books are relatively close. Yeah, mine are always close because I use them for notes while I'm here. Mm-hmm. So the I, I'm a Wes Craig fan. I'm glad he's getting like a big run up in uh, a lot of the DC stuff. Like he's doing a lot of the variant covers for the new thing, right? Right. So just the way that it was in my bag, it was given to me with, you know, if, you know, cause obviously it's upside down or whatever it is, the way that it works. It was the uh, new absolute people side first. Okay. That was the side that I read first. Mm-hmm. And it's very interesting in how this all lays out. And it's so silly that I ended up reading it the wrong way, I guess. I, I, right. And I'm only saying you read it the wrong way because I'm always right. But I also feel that, uh, and we'll get into the story, is that the DC story starts off with them putting together the Justice League Unlimited story. And uh, the Dark Side story runs into the middle of that. I don't know how to explain it the best. It way. bleeds through. Right. And I do like that as you read both, you see more after you read both sides, because as you're reading the, and I'm just going to call it the DC proper and the dark side side, the DC proper one has bits and you see dark side talking and it doesn't really make sense what's going on. But when you read the dark side uh, one, you see that he's actually talking to the specter. So it, it, his all his word bubbles if you read the DC side make no sense until you read the back end you know what I mean and I really thought that was cool right it was I really liked the way the book was laid out mm-hmm. that it was two stories that overlap with each other and lead into each other in the middle and they the it's a centerfold in the middle that could be looked at either way 
Right. Because you have to turn the book sideways for the centerfold. So it works out with the it being a flip book. That's absolute genius as far as I'm concerned. Yes. It was a genius in layout and publishing and so on and so forth. And luckily the story is really good too. You know, we'll talk about the Justice League side first, the DC proper side. Um, it's very booster gold centric, which yes. I'm already sold, right? Mm-hmm. Almost and like the, he's getting a glow up too, but go ahead. I'm, and I'm okay with that as well. And a lot of it focuses around those touchstone items in the DC universe. And one of them being that blank Justice League membership card, which <laughs> again, a little ham fisted as to why it's there, but right. it's a key point that ties everything back to the, you know, from the present to the future where Booster is from. And then the big catastrophe happens, and they end up sending Booster and Skeets through to investigate what this is. And then he ends up, Booster does, in the middle of everything that was happening on the dark side side of the book. And that even starts out by saying 52 days earlier, you know, that favorite number of the DC Universe. And let me ask you a question on the Skeets booster gold stuff was it weird seeing skeets be the goofball and like actually try like his booster is like trying to be a hero and skeets is like should i do all those wacky things that you like no it's like well maybe this wacky thing because skeets feels like he's not booster do you know what i mean like it's just it's it's weird to see the the roles reverse but i but i like it because i like booster gold you can't do no wrong with him yeah it's very it's it one of our favorite characters collectively on the show, definitely a character that is difficult to get wrong because there's always ways that you could explain why he's having these wild shifts in his personality, right? Yep. And then you have the other side of the book, which is the dark side book, which is basically what's going to explain the absolute universe. Pretty right. much. And the, the, essentially what it is, is when dark side tries to take over and obtain the specter's power he finds out that dark side needs to be that constant mm-hmm. um you know in in the world the multiverse or whatever it is but now that the main dc universe is cut off from the um you know the 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 multiverse mm-hmm. and that world is the alpha f- world or whatever it is that they call it dark side can make a world that's shaped in his image Mm -hmm. without the interference of the heroes but obviously the the original the you know the three absolute books that are coming out are batman superman and wonder woman the trinity the big three if you will so that even in a world where dark side creates it on it on its own it would definitely seem as though the world itself creates these counterbalances to dark side which is batman superman and wonder woman Mm mm-hmm and I feel like the gist of it is, is like, I'm going to create a world where all the heroes are the underdog now. Like, because he explains it, like our DC universe that we love is like, they all have the upper hand. Like it's the villains are on the run. And he, the, the way he sets it up, he's like, they are all the underdogs and it's a challenge for them. And f- what I gather from this story is, it is, and I find that intriguing that it's now the uphill slog for the new absolute heroes. I actually like you sold me on the premise in this like little bit when he creates the absolute world. I'm like, okay, you have me on the premise. Now follow through on the stories and I'll stay around. Yeah. So. Uh, but I really liked it. I, you know, the juxtaposition of the two art styles on the DC proper side of the dark side side, the way everything melded together. Todd, if I have one complaint about this book, that it's a flip book. No, I again, I love that it was the flip book. Ingenious. Uh, the fact that I did not know it was a flip book, I was delighted when I discovered it was a flip book, when I got to the middle of the book. And I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, it was. I was delighted. I was tickled. I wish you could have seen me, right? Right. I just um, want to enjoy you enjoying the flip book. Joe. That's right. Uh, Todd, um, who's Uxus? That is Darkseid's shoot name. Todd, I don't want to know Darkseid's shoot name. I know Darkseid is Darkseid. And mm-hmm. listen, even if I knew Darkseid's shoot name, I don't like people calling Darkseid by his shoot name. You put some respect on his name. You call him Darkseid. That's it. Yep. 
Uh, I, I, I'm with you. It took me back for a little bit because I completely forgot. Like, that's like one of those small knowledge things that I learned along the way. And I don't know where that actually was first pronounced. I know we know a couple of new God fans, so maybe they'll tell us. But, uh, yeah, it was like when they were, I was like, who's Uxus? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's Dark Side. Uh, no, but I'm with you. I, I'm with you. You know, I'm with you. You know. Dark side's the way, what he'll always be to me. And I've heard footage, like, was everybody goes dark seed, dark side. I've heard audio of Jack Kirby saying dark, dark side. So I will always say that. In the animated series and stuff, they called him dark side. Right, which is fine, but I'm going to go by actually the guy who created him and was doing uh, interviews. You know what I mean? So. Mm-hmm. so last but not least, we have Hyde Street number one. Uh, from Image slash Ghost Machine, written by Jeff Johns with art by Ivan Hayes. Uh, this is the horror book, if you will. Mm-hmm. And and again, it is horror. Um, but it's more so. You you would mention before how Waller in Absolute Power gets the Twilight Zone thing. Right. This definitely feels like Twilight Zoney turned up to eleven sort of thing. Yeah, meets a kind of a creep show, kind of a bit, whatever. Yeah. So you're introduced to some characters early on, specifically Mr. X Ray, who's on the main cover, and Pranky. Pranky, who is, you know, for the primary of this book, uh, a Boy Scout, right? Mm-hmm. And Hyde Street is this place that exists nebulously wherever it needs to exist. And we get um, Mr. X-Ray's origin here as to why he is on Hyde Street and wants to get out of Hyde Street. But we also learn the larger scope of everything is that Hyde Street and what they do on Hyde Street is a competition. Right. And Pranky's doing real good. Mm -hmm. And Mr. X-Ray is not doing so good. Yeah, I mean, they kind of lay it out, like, obviously, like you said, that it's a nebulous place. It's a place that is Hyde Street, but it's everywhere in the world. And if you kind of mess up, you can be, you can walk onto Hyde Street without knowing it. And then once you're there, there's ambiguous rules that they kind of lay out a little bit in this book. And that's what I like it. Throughout the book, they drop hints, and I don't understand everything, but I get the gist of things. You know what I mean? And they kind of say it's like when somebody shows up on Hyde Street, there are various people on Hyde Street who are stuck there, like X, Mr. X-Ray and the Pranky. And whoever finds that person first gets to help, lead, destroy. All options are open. And whatever it does is you kind of maybe get points and maybe you can get out and Mr. X-Ray wants to get out and it's just like, all right, this is on this. And then they just go next issue, kind of like pranky story. And I feel we're going to get pranky story. We're going to get more of what's going on. And they kind of give you some of the background characters, like the doctor, Mr. Ego. And all of it was right up Todd's alley for like, the creepy level of, 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 of what I like. It was just enough and interesting and laid it out that I, I absolutely like love this book. I thought Hyde street was, was really good for what it was. Cause I had no idea what I was going to get other than uh, a horror book, as they were saying, very right. interesting premise, very and, great you know, we, premise. We, we talked last week and we've talked over the last couple of months here about the resurgence of horror books and comics, right? And I would not say that the Oni stuff has failed by any stretch of the imagination. You know, they they extended the Epitaphs from the Abyss from a six-issue thing to an ongoing with specials and all this other stuff, right? Right. And those books are good, but there's just something missing from them, right? And I think the thing that's missing from them is a through line, a narrative, a way that these things connect, right? Mm -hmm. And it's great to read a horror story, a horror short story, and, like, here's your six pages, your 12 pages, or whatever it is. But the fact that Hyde Street has that, and there's only two in this issue. There's the thing with Pranky and the old lady. Right. And there's Mr. X-Ray's origin story. Mm Mm-hmm. Those are the only two horror-elemented things that we get in the book. 
that are stories like that that technically in and of themselves could exist independently. But because they have that narrative, because they have that through line, and yes, you could say that in, even in the old EC comic books, you had like your Crypt Keeper, your Vault Keeper, your Old Witch, who were those were your narrative st- storytelling characters who were the ones that appear at the beginning and the end of the storylines. But they themselves are not having any um, onus upon them, any sort of adventures or character growth or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Hyde Street is taking it to the next level by introducing you to these characters and giving you a reason to root for them or root against them. While they are doing these horrible and evil things, or will be doing these horrible and evil things, that are essentially just going to be one-off short story horror tales that are going to be bound together by these characters that are going to be introduced through the course of this book. Right. And if that makes any sense to you, I think, and I'm not going to say that this is some sort of novel concept, I'm going to say it's a novel concept to me, because I've never seen this done before in a horror-type book. And I think that's what's going to separate this and make this stand out from what we're going to see over the next several months and have seen over the last several months, the tons and tons of horror books that we're going to be getting. Right. And like I said, when a something like the Onis or any of the, the, the horror stories, when they're done, they're short stories or one like ish, issue story and they have the cool trick ending or the cre- that's when they're good. But I feel like when you have that stuff, you get more misses than hits. Okay. Where this, you have an overarching story where it's like, all right, um, you're not going to have the same things over and over again. And maybe you have these because Reoc- usually a horror story is one and done. There's no reoccurring characters. Where this, there's people, like you said, to root for, to root against. Um, You want to see this guy prevail. You want to see Pranky get his comeuppance. Whatever the things are that lay out to you, and uh, that's what's going to keep this uh, fresh. Where along the line, you could throw in that eight-page mini horror story and get the cool trick ending. But once again, now we have characters we're interested in along the way. So I, I'm with you, but I may be saying a different way. So Right. No, I think we're on the same page in regards to this. It was definitely an interesting way to attack and handle. Now, there is going to be the main story, uh, Hyde Street. I know they've already solicited at least one um, one shot of one of the characters that they do like an ad for in the book itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I also like that a lot of the, the nomenclature and a lot of what the book is based around is your 50s um what like adds like a very 50 sensibility right but i think that has to do like i have uh, maybe because with the boy scout pranky thing we'll get more of that because i do like what the merit badges bit and stuff like that but mr x-ray with his origin was yeah. the whole bit of selling those um fake ad stuff like tricking kids out of their money and i feel like and i and i don't know because we're not going to get when we see the the board of people like there's uh a gen z like spelled j-e-n dad like space z so like maybe like that character you could parody the gen z era do you know what i'm saying like yeah it's like it's open to more than the 50s. I feel like we got that because these two characters have a very 50s feel. Like, obviously, if you're going to go to the Boy Scouts, like the Boy Scouts, like today, does it, uh, nobody talks about them. But it's got a very 50s feel. And the the lady crossing the street bit is from every cartoon I watched as a kid. You know what I mean? And, and stuff like that. So I get it. I just feel like you can go in any direction, like with uh storytelling because you could bring in a character who's space age or something like that if you wanted to go that route right but anyway i've I've babbled on long enough no it's a good book definitely check it out if you Mm. have been interested and wanted to try one of the horror things that have come out recently and weren't really sure where to dive in i would recommend this most on anything else Uh, So that's what we read from this past week. Let's get into what we're looking forward to coming out this week. Uh, One, if you head over to longboxheroes.com, every Tuesday around noon Eastern time, we put up the poll post, which is a link to a link to all the books that are coming out this week. Whether you get your books in print, whether you get them digitally, whether you get them sent to your home, however it is you get your books, be forewarned, be forearmed, know what's coming out this week. Todd and I attempt to guess what the other is most looking forward to coming out this week. 
Todd is currently in the lead over me with one correct guess. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at Todd's list, and I am going to guess the book that you were most looking forward to coming out this week is Absolute Batman number one. It is absolute Batman number one. Uh, I want to see, like, as I, we said, the all in universe, like now, now that you've hooked me, see if you can keep me. Yep. Um, I'm looking over your list and I'm just going to shoot my shot. And is the book you're looking forward to most from Ahoy toxic Avenger number one? No, it's absolute Batman. It's absolute Batman. Number one, as much as I love Toxie, you ain't reading Toxie. So Toxie, you know, Talks to be fun. Talks to be dumb for me, and I'll love it. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm going in predisposed um, to enjoying that book, but I'm really interested to see what Absolute Batman is going to bring. All right. I evened it up uh, by by goofing it up. But now, if you had been able to get your Mark photo with Toxie, would that have changed your mind? Nah. Nah, okay. Todd, you know what? Hmm. That's not the real Toxic Avenger. That's just the guy in a suit. Wait a minute. Are you <laughs> sure? I saw him Pretty getting sure. in his car. Yeah. Yeah. So he I, had a mop and everything. It was I am sad seat. because I would have done the the doink mirror bit with him. Mm. You know? I, I don't know. <laughs> I think people would have said that guy's way more handsome than, uh, than that other one. Oh, absolutely. You, f- you figure out which one I'm talking about. But that's the bit. That's the bit, you know? No, I get you. I get you. It's it's your bit with words, I know. Oh, my goodness. So, wait, are you saying Toxie looks like words, too? No, he looks more like Melvin Junko. He's the before picture. Oh, okay. Now, when is the new Toxic Avenger movie coming out, Joe? <sighs> I like that's to a, just hear you That's gasp. a crusade that I really don't want to get into. Right. Uh, I, I'm with you. Maybe you should come up with an unwieldy hashtag. I've thought about it. Mm-hmm. Anyway. I gotta figure out how many omnibuses got fouled up in the last 20 years or whatever it is. <laughs> oh boy. Uh anyway, so while you're over at longboxheroes.com, of course, be sure to check out past episodes of this show, past episodes of Longbox Heroes After Dark, and our current ongoing Ton and Joe have issues. Uh, where we are rereading all of Gail Simone's Secret Six from the very beginning. And this week we're reading issue 23, which is not by Gail Simone. But that's okay, because the two fill-in issues that we've had so far were both written by John Ostrander. John Ostrander, notorious, famous for many, many comics, but I would say one of the comics that he's most noteworthy for is Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad, more or less. The spiritual uh, father of Secret Six. So, uh, you know, we're reading the whole thing, so it counts, right? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I'm fine with that. Now, just something funny I want to mention before we um, uh, get into the issue itself. So... I recently came upon a podcast. They did one episode. I don't think they're going to be doing any more. Um, but it's a food podcast by uh, three sandwich guys. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's uh, John Baymeyer, the, San- the Sandwich Tribunal. There's Barry Enderwick the sa- of Sandwiches of History, which is a YouTube channel that I think gets posted in the Discord quite frequently. And then there's Sandwich Dad. Sandwich Dad's name is John Ostrander. Oh, the guy who wrote (laughs) Suicide Squad. Got it. And again, I'm sitting here, I'm like, wait a minute. This can't be the John Ostrander as I'm listening to the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not the John Ostrander. But what are the odds that in like two forms of multimedia comic books and sandwich podcasts there happen to be two guys named john ostrander that both come across my desk within like days of each other i would say it's the same odds of good versus bad omnibuy okay 50 50 i was gonna say like a little less than 50 50 okay 45 percent um but this is a one shot this specifically states that it takes place uh, before issue 19, so we know where it fits into the grand scheme of things, thankfully. Uh, right. Not as wide as a swath. Um, but more or less, this is 
someone gets the wild idea of, hey, let's do the 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 movie, which was based on a book called The Most Dangerous Game. Mm-hmm. But instead, let's hire the suicides or the, the secret six and try to kill them. And right. uh, it ends exactly how you think it would end, Todd. Well, for uh, all the people trying to kill the secret six, right? No. Sure. No. <sighs> And again, that's like the cliff notes of it, but there's a very fun issue, uh, a very light issue almost, but it's a team building issue, right? Mm-hmm. We get to see the team separated. We get to see how they work together. We get to see how they work alone. We get to see the pranks that they pull on each other, uh, like Deadshot telling um, <laughs> ragdoll lies about how flight works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just thought it was a good issue just to kind of like really encapsulate who the team, the team is, who they are individually. John Ostrander, I think, gets a very clear message of who these characters are across each other. And uh, the artist, R.B. Silva's art, is really nice in it as well. Yes. Um, my favorite bit in the whole thing is obviously because, you know, they give them all control callers. And, like, you know, the, through the callers, they could track them and they could communicate. Uh, like, the people on the island tell them what's going on. And I do like this, like, oh, around your necks are these things. They carry this. They carry that. And electrical charges will happen if they try to, to remove it. So immediately, what does Bane try to do, Joe? Just <laughs> rip it off. Right. And it goes like, Bane, you need to stop. It will only get stronger until he kills you. And he just rips it off. And I love that he's holding the, like, the, the smashed remnants of the collar and just like, just those cool Bane lines that we get. He's like, I think you do not understand the trouble, trouble you are in. I will come teach you. And I'm like, there's a man who said it, and there's a man who means it, and there's uh-huh. a man who's going to make it happen, Joe. <laughs> And we get the bit where he makes it happen, where he mm-hmm. confronts the person who his task is. And again, there's like the bits with the people that come here. They get to pay two million dollars to hunt a real person. You know, everyone has code names that are after president. So no one knows anyone's real identities, of course. And, you know, mm-hmm. everyone gets assigned a different member of the Secret Six. And Bane gets the guy who was after him and says, you know, I've I broke the spine of the Batman. Mm-hmm. but that's too good for you. And then he yep. just rips the guy's arms out of the sockets and beats him to death with them. Right. Didn't Jason do that in one of the movies? Um, I, I, I think Jason might've ripped somebody else's arm off and beat somebody else to death with it. Oh, okay. I think it's more insulting when you're being beat to death by your own arm. Right. And you know what I do like at the end, you know, they figure out how they're going to get off the island and it's a boat. And luckily, we get some ragdoll sea shanties, so that's fantastic. But again, it's a light, it's a fun issue, just getting you through everything. Right, a one-off. Yeah. Now, next week, we're reading issue 24. Mm -hmm. Gail and Jim Califiori are back. Right. And I have literal issues with the way that this is collected. No, because this is the beginning of a a four part story arc. And the way, according to the according to and I cross referenced it on DC's website, Wikipedia and (laughs) Amazon. Right. That the most popular iterations of these trades cuts this particular trade that we're reading off at issue 25. So you get the first two issues of this four issue crossover in this trade, and if you want to pick them up, the other two issues are in the next trade. Now, obviously, you're going to get all the trades. Well, I don't know. I would have made me move, like, those two to the other trade. Or, like, the other two to this trade. I don't know. I don't know. That would really chap my anatomy. There you go. But... <laughs> but hopefully you're following along. Maybe you have the single issues like Todd and myself do, so this is not an issue. Um, coming up soon, another thing on my... Uh, docket of things i gotta add it to my note of things about what i gotta ask our local retailer about picking up a long box omnibus those shipping towns errors i have the shipping towns written down um and then um 25 schedule for half issues oh okay 
just kind of like how it has to break up. We know what it's going to be. Um, you'll find out early to start preparing on mm-hmm. uh, November 1994's Briefing the Past. I believe so. Yep, and then we'll let everyone know everything else after that. You just get right, to in find December. out early. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so while again you're over at longboxheroes.com, be sure to check out our store, get shirts and pins and stickers with our fancy logo on them. Shoot me a line, I'll help you out. We'll 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 make this happen. We'll fulfill your dreams and get you some uh some of our stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, T-, T Public Sale is going on as we speak. 35% off designs inspired by this show, by After Dark, by the soon-to-be-named network itself. Uh, and that's uh, those designs on anything from cell phone covers to notebooks to decorative throws, uh, everything in between. You can also help us out by making any and all of your eBay purchases through our eBay affiliate link. This page contains affiliate links for ebay we may receive a small commission on purchases that you make you can use the affiliate link anytime you want to buy anything on ebay and support the show at the same time yeah but the bestest and greatest way to support the show is by signing up for the patreon over at patreon.com slash longbox heroes for as little as a dollar a month you're going to get all this you're going to get two bonus shows every month from todd and myself you're going to get comic book oddities where we look at some of the lesser known, much maligned, maybe rightfully forgotten attempts to bring comic books to the small screen or the silver screen. Many of these are pre Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's a couple, two, three that are after it. Um, next week, we'll be rolling out on the Patreon uh, the episode that we did with Adam, my co host over on At Odds with Wrestling, and Todd's co host over on Porch Talk. Uh, the 1994 classic, the highest grossing Jean-Claude Van Damme movie of all time in Time Cop. Uh, we've already spun the wheel for November, and we might be goofing the wheel for December. So right. when you tune into that episode, you'll find out November. And then once that's available for everyone, we'll let you know what's going on for December as well. But I think you can figure it out if you remember what we did for February. Mm-hmm. Remember February? That feels like forever ago. It feels a February ago. Yep. The other um, the other show is previewing the past. Aforementioned, we look at 30 years ago this month's previews catalog. Todd and I just came off recording October 1994, and we stumbled upon some early drafts of what the Age of Apocalypse was supposed to look like. Yeah, I'm glad we ended up not glancing over that accidentally. Yep. Um, among other things as well. Um, in that previous catalog, of course, you can also get, you know, uh, you know, you can get the same RSS feed, get the main show here, get After Dark if you're an RSS feed fan, so you don't have separate RSS feeds, one for the Patreon, one for the main show, one for uh, After Dark. It's all on one feed if you are so inclined. Um, the dollar is also going to get you the full scans of the preview catalogs, expertly done, high quality. I had people reaching out to me recently asking me how you do it, Todd. What is your magic? What is it's your a... trick to get these scans? And I told them, I'm not telling them. You know what? I'll give you one tip. It's a steady hand, Joe. The steadiest hand in the biz right here in, in old righty here, Joe. Oh, that's the hand that you uh, will. Wait a minute. Uh, how would that the again? It's a visual joke from Blazing Saddles, so it doesn't work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but oh, that is that the scan that you uh, is that the hand you scan the previews with? <laughs> no, it's no, this it's this one. hand. Yeah. Yep, I love uh, it. Hey, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was gonna say before I start doing Blazing Saddle jokes, I still one of my favorites. Like, you need any help? Only all I can get. I use that all the time. <laughs> Five dollars is going to get you those two bonus shows uh, two weeks before everyone else. It's also going to get you after dark two days before everyone else, so that you can listen to these shows in the correct listening order. So uh, everything everything that we do here makes sense, but if you listen to these things in the correct listening order, they make more sense. Right, a little wibbly wobbly timey wimey sometimes. That's right. It's like Time Cop who. Uh, Doctor Who ripped everything off from. So they'd be in two places at once. Stop it. Uh, so let's get into some TV talk. I think we can get this oh, out of wait. the way. Todd, you did not go see Joker 2 this week. I did not, but I do want to touch on one thing before we do. Um, right. The pigskin, 
pigs pigskin pickums oh yes i forgot at this um, point i'm mathematically eliminated so it's fine. right you're you listen you're mathematically eliminated in august okay um but uh i made a surge so i'm tied for third and these are legit thirds because there's a of somebody in the first place somebody in the second place and then i'm tied for third with it with a group of people but uh as long as i'm in front of everybody else on the soon to be named network i'm okay if i'm not in first so that's always good there's only one person in front of me that i that i don't want in front of me and that's a, a mildly tempered bassist so i got to overtake that and then i'll be fine all right. Well, you keep grinding. Uh, you keep trying, and I think you'll get first for at least one week, and then you could close the whole thing down and say we're done. Well, you know what? That seems like a good idea. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But now on to TV talk. I'm sorry. Well, on I to have TV a good t- week. Yeah, I got to mention it. On to TV talk. Um, Agatha. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know. Again, it's another one. I didn't take notes because I watched it with my wife. Um, right. it's another trial on the witch's road because they lost, uh, Kitty, Mrs. Hart. They actually have to choose the green witch, uh, which is Aubrey Plaza's character. Right. Who I was calling Blackheart, but she, I think for the first time she says her name is Rio. Yes. And she dances in the sand. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, so with that, we get to learn a little bit of the history that Agatha and Rio may have with each other. Right. We get a little bit more focus on uh, Alice's character, since this is like the musical side of things. They take them back to like, you know, like 60s appropriate clothing, which again was very appropriate. Um, I will say, I think they spent the wig budget on last week's episode, not so much on this week's episode. Right, and I have that in my notes. I knew you were going to nitpick that, but I feel like it's supposed to look like bad 70s, 60s hair, so I was okay with it. I was 100% okay with it. And uh, who's the woman who plays Agatha? Her last name is Catherine Hahn, right? The great Catherine Hahn, yes. Catherine Hahn. Um, Once again, another great costume for Catherine Hahn. Mm -hmm. Deep V's compliment her. When you get a chance, Todd, um, Mm -hmm. if you go over to, uh, wow, I'll, I'll just let you know this here. So, um, when you go to IMDB Mm -hmm. for uh, a TV show, right? A lot of times there's keywords that are set up Mm -hmm. for a TV show or a movie or whatever it is. And some of the keywords on this are like hog and fire and singing guitar digging fainting blood piano shovel forest um i think did i say crying no crying is not on the list twice reference to switzerland okay okay not greenland um but two of the other keywords that are on this episode todd Mm -hmm. are cleavage and brawless cleavage and brawless. I think I'm doing old Johnny Carson bits now, but yeah. Right. And then, uh, you know, you could do the advanced search on those uh, terms if you wanted to kind of dive deeper into that more thematic thing, you know? Eat Rose, I want to dive into that. There you go. But, but I uh, thought that was an okay episode. It's the formula. We get a little bit yep. more of the plot, not much more of the plot. Focus We're moving things along. Witch. Right. Focus on one witch each episode. Yeah. Um, the one thing I don't, I don't have much on it, but I did like the bit with uh, t- uh, cause her name's Alice. Cause I remember it was Alice Cooper as the witch um, thing where she ends up saying, everybody kept saying that her mother died on the road. So everybody equates that it was on this road. And she's like, no, she died on the road. Cause she was a musician people. She died on the road, like doing her bit. And you find out that Alice was cursed and the whole thing, she made the popular song as a ward to protect her daughter from the demon that was chasing her. And because somewhere, anywhere in the world at one time, the there's someone singing this song. So the magic is intact. And I was like, Oh, this is all good bits. Like the word play with the road and the thing. And I actually really liked the bit with them playing the song and the demon shows up. And I thought the demon looked really cool. Um, once again, for like my level of scary, this is, this is right in my wheelhouse. This is the scariest, 
because I want my show. So uh, it's it's kind of fun. It's like a reverse Wizard of Oz. Um, it's this time it's it's witches easing on down the road. Um, I'm not going to say it's perfect. Uh, uh, but I enjoy it and I'm not a shipper, but I am an Agatha and Rio shipper for some reason. I don't know. I getcha. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aubrey Plaza plays hot, crazy, very, very well. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Uh, let's get into penguin. I'll let you mm-hmm. take point on this if that's okay. No, that's fine. Um, basically this is now, uh, Sophia, and the penguins like uh like plan to sell their drugs but the real crux of this is we end up getting the origin story like the past story of victor uh the dr- penguins uh what would you call it driver and assistant or whatever and it takes place during the batman movie and i like the bit where he has the argument with his parents because his parent his father's from another country and he comes to a better place and he ends up uh, saying, like, like I'm good with what I do. I don't need to, like, have better because this is good. But the kid wants it. And that'll be a theme that plays out. And he goes off with his girlfriend, who we meet in this, and watch the fireworks during election night, which takes place during the Batman movie, which comes during No Man's Land because the Riddler busts the water thing in. And the bit where it's heading right towards his apartment is fantastic. And he tries to call. And I, I was like, that's really cool. And then that kind of plays out. He has his moment where he wants to go with Penguin and, and Sophia, but they're like, no, you stay here. So he sees the girlfriend and talks about like their future. She wants to go. He's afraid to go because he'll end up getting killed. But because Penguin paid him his salary now that he has, he's like, well, get me a ticket. I'm going to come with you. And that's kind of where we leave it until it dovetails back into the penguin story and the penguin story is interesting because he's with Sophia and we get hearing out information that there was something in the past where the penguin betrayed Sophia and like we get the, the payoff at that at the end kind of a deal, but he goes, he's going to get the Chinese mafia involved and they don't trust him. So they blackmail the, the one uh, second in command and he's Johnny. got a fall, Johnny and he's got to fall for it. And that's a great bit. And then they go and they they get the, the Chinese people to help, but they go to the club at night and they have the party. He gets all, Penguin gets his, his uh, friend, uh, the lady of the evening and all her friends to sell the drug, which we find out was Sophia's drug at Arkham was they were using it to placate and 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 make them submissive all the the people. It's like a mushroom drug called, what did they end up calling it? Bliss, right? Bliss, yes. But I love the bit where Sophia's like, you're just coming along. You're nothing. Like, you think you're something, but you're not. And when when we go, I talk, and occasionally the Penguin would interrupt with important stuff to sell because Sophia was losing it. But then Sophia talking to the guy ends up coming around again. And the whole dynamic between them is great. And he's showing the guys, like, look at my product selling like hotcakes on the floor. And Vic at this point has come around and he's the bag man. He's carrying the bag, Joe. And it's a A different kind of bag, but yeah, different kind of bag where he's on the floor and he, all the light flashes are making him relive the, uh, uh, no man's land bit. And I have to say the one thing that actually bothered me in a good way was when the water hits and they don't dwell on it, but you see the bodies floating in the water for a hot second and i'm like this is all done really well and he's kind of like well i'm gonna make the run for it with my girlfriend because he might kill me whatever and penguin confronts him in the bathroom and he ends up like seeing the the text he's like we're gonna leave with my money he's like no i just wanted to leave and he's like when you thought i you were my prisoner because he ends up saying to his girlfriend this guy's lonely and he needs me around 
But then he's kind of a mentor. The bit where he goes to dinner with him and he tells him to stand up for himself is more father-like than anything. So there's like this weird relationship is really cool. And then he go- he decides he's going to make a run for it because Penguin scares the heck out of him. But he goes and it comes around again where his father says, you want a better life. I'm good. He does. And he goes back and he ends up saving the Penguin and Sophia. We find out that they had a relationship and he ends up saving them from the Maroney family because the Penguin's got his fingers in all the pies. And he ends up, and I like that Vic ends up taking somebody out with the car. I think that guy's going to be okay though, Joe. Um, and he gets away, but they leave Sophie in the clutches of the Maroni. I'm like, this this show is all over the place in such a good way. I, I, I love it. I'm sorry if I went too fast. Is there anything you want to touch on? I like this episode, didn't love this episode. Mm-hmm. I get that they need to make you care about Vic, mm-hmm. but in a show called The Penguin, with all the people that they've introduced, Vic is maybe my fourth favorite. I, I get it, but I feel like you need to see that to understand his relationship with the Penguin. And even further in this episode alone, you need to see all that so that when he has that moment on the floor of the club, when he essentially has like PTSD from the flooding of Gotham, right? Right. And you get the will they, won't they with the girl. I knew he wasn't going to show up. You, no. you know, the troubled family and everything and the parallels. I like the scene when Penguin and Vic are out to eat and the waiter goes and cuts Vic off because Vic has a, a stutter and Penguin stands up for him and it's like, don't let people talk to you like that and that sort of thing, you know? Yep. And I I like the bit where he's like, he does it and he says, thank you for that. He's like, you're welcome, but you should do it. And I yeah. love the line. He's like, take up space. Like, take up space. And that comes up later in the episode, like, when he's talking to him. And I'm like, that's such a great line. Right. Go ahead. Sorry. So the the deal and the other part of it. So, again, too much Vic, whatever. I get why it's there. But I want more Penguin. I want more Sophia. I even want no Penguin's mom in this episode. I, I think that was another thing as well, that we got too much Vic. And I'm like, couldn't we have gotten rid of one Vic scene so we got, could have got at least one scene of the Penguin's mom? Right? Mm-hmm. Even if it was just her roaming the streets aimlessly thinking it was Sunday when it wasn't again, you know, <laughs> taking some bliss. But we get the bit at the end where the deal goes wrong. Vic comes back. He crashes the car in and Penguin makes a getaway. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's going to go too well with Sophia that Penguin kind of left her, you know, with the the the, the, the family. family. Right. right yeah. So, again, it seems as though we we, pe- we postulated last week is, like, the Penguin, a guy who makes bad decisions or makes people think that he makes bad decisions, so they kind of underestimate him a little bit. But I would say him leaving Sophia there might have been a bad decision. I think it's a bad decision in the moment, but also a good one because he doesn't have a choice. Because as soon as they get in the car, the gunshots start happening. Right. So you don't have a choice. It's either die, like die there or kind of come back and get her. And I do think he's not going to leave her, but that leaves the whole thing with trust issues with Sophia. Yeah. Um, because she already has trust issues with him, and he le- he leaves her. I will also say if Sophia doesn't get me to start smoking again by the end of the show, I'm going to be <laughs> really surprised because every time she rips a heater, I want one. No, it's just uh, just so good uh, smoking cigarettes. And the other thing is, <laughs> when when Johnny tells uh, Sophia that she should leave because when the boss tells you to go to Italy, you go to Italy, and she's like, "I need a couple of days. You have two days, and you go to Italy." Or I tell people that's where you went. I wonder what that implies, Joe. I um, think he's gonna I, just keep he, her in the basement. Uh, I think he's gonna send her to Hoboken. I love that. I'm like, I know immediately what Johnny needs means in that, but <sighs> so good. A lot of great writing in this. Do you ever watch the end credits at all? No. Okay, because I, I have to go back and watch. It's great. You know how like uh the the Marvel ones kind of start with things that'll pop up in the show? If you watch the end credits, and I don't know if they change every week, but there's random things that are constantly in there, but then as they mention them, 
through, like in this episode, there'll be key points and they add them to the animation at the end of the episode. Like last week when the penguin mentions the jazz club that his mother takes him to, it's in the end credits. And it's like really cool. I like actually like to watch them and see. And now I have to, because I caught it, watch and see if they change more. Like if they add stuff or it's me just thinking they did and they were there every time. So I, f- gotcha. I find that real. I like when they do interesting stuff with every second of the show, if that makes any sense. Like even the credits you're making interesting to me. I'm going to make a concerted effort next week to watch the full credits to see what I see. Right. But otherwise, I'm with you. Great show. All right. I think that's it. Did you say there was there something you wanted to say about the Joker too, or no? No, Joker two. I might. I'm going to try and get to see this week, but okay. I don't. I don't know. We'll see. But if I do, I'll 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 talk about it on here. All right. No problem. So that is episode seven thirty one of Longbox Heroes for Todd. This is Joe saying. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you all here next week. Remember, be a faucet, not a drain. You're listening to the soon-to-be-named network, the Lamborghini of Podcast Networks. The Rob is a long box hero. The Rob is a long box hero. He gives us five five stars.